Welcome everyone. Lovely seeing the faces. Uh, it's been a long time and we promised you that we would start with our webinar sooner, but actually it took us longer time in order to prepare to make sure that we have wonderful speakers that would add to the uh, quality of what we are providing you. And today is no exception. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Mark Snukas. But before, I would like to reiterate the uh, usual way we handle our webinars. Please, everyone, keep mute, but do keep the camera on if, if you can, because we would love to see the faces with us. And all the questions would go into the chat, please. Um, Mark will give us the cue on when uh, to answer a question, um, if related to the subject he's talking about at the moment. If not, I will moderate all the questions at the end. We will keep this lively. I know that you will get lots of information and it's a new subject. Um, we're going to talk about the human-centric organization. So we're going to talk about us, the people, uh, the ones who deliver the service, but also the ones who have colleagues that they work with uh, day in, day out. In introducing Mark, I would say that he believes strongly in delivering results while strengthening the mindset and capabilities of the people he collaborates with. Because one of the main motors he, or his objectives is enabling leaders to deliver growth, innovation, and transformation through the new ways of thinking, and also through the new ways of working, which is part of what we will be talking about today. And when I summarize his bio, you will fully understand how his experience provided him with very unique expertise in order to deliver his services, whether as a coach or an advisor or as a trainer, and by the way, as an author. So to officially introduce him, Dr. Mark Snukas is a professor of management and innovation at the Luxembourg School of Business and an executive education faculty member at Duke Corporate Education and Emeritus, a passionate executive coach, advisor, and has been working with leaders and the executive teams, helping them to deliver new growth, innovation, and transformation since 2002. But I'm not saying he's old. I'm only saying he's experienced, okay? Also, Mark is the author of several books on strategy, business model, innovation, and building new growth businesses. He's a sought out after speaker, and that's why we have him with us today. And he talks and mainly delivers um, around the topics of growth, strategy, strategic innovation, and the new ways of working. And he's a former director of innovation at Deloitte, while now he currently serves with them as an independent advisor. He's on the board of advisors of the Global Innovation Institute. And by the way, thank you for making me know about the existence of such a, an association. I didn't know before. I looked it up, looked at, at the website, and I would advise everyone to actually go look at it. Prior to that, he was co-founder of Business Model Gallery, the world's largest business model database. So now you know, when I talk about Unique, Mark is all of that. And last but not least, Mark is the founder of Brave New Leaders, which falls in line with our theme of what we are trying to establish, the future of consulting that has the young leaders within it. It's a think tank on new human-centered ways of organizing, working, and leading. And again, that all takes us to the human-centric organization, what it is, and why should we care about that? So it's all about the new way of doing work, and I believe that's the background that Mark will start with in order to have us understand or get to the um, specific knowledge of the human-centric organization itself and tell us more about it. So Mark, the mic is yours, the floor is yours. Give me cues when you want me to uh, put on questions on the table that are in the chat, but now I close my mouth and you start. Great, hey, thanks a lot. Thanks, Rima, for the nice uh, invitation there yeah, to, to be here today. And thanks to, to all of you for, for taking the time to, um, to be here. So let me just put up my slides here and just rearrange the windows a little bit so I can see the chat. So as Rima said, while I'm talking, and if you have any, any questions or comments, anything that comes to mind, just uh, put it into the chat. And uh, if, I, if I see it, then uh, I maybe can address it right away or else we can also have a discussion. Uh, at the end. So really don't hesitate to ask questions. I mean, this is this is your session. I'm here for you and want to provide value. So uh, let's let's make sure that you get the most uh, most out of it. 
Now, uh, the human-centric organization, and what I'd like to, to talk a little bit about today is uh, something that Rima maybe has not pointed out that much in the, in the introduction is that uh, I've always been very interested in innovation and innovation is kind of like the, the red thread through the, the 20 years uh, of my, my working life. And it started off with more innovation on, a, on the strategic side, uh, how to create new growth through innovation. Then it moved more towards business model innovation. Uh, and then it went into how can you enable innovation capabilities in companies, which then led me to this uh, idea of new ways of working and, uh, and the, the human centric organization, which is also all about, so how can we apply new ways of working in order to drive innovation and adaptability and resilience and engagement and all these things that have become quite fashionable and important also in the uh, in the last uh, couple of years. So, and to, to kind of approach that topic of new ways of working and, and uh, human-centric organization, uh, I'd like to, to cover these three things here today. So the first one is uh, looking a little bit into why uh, should we care about new ways of working? Why are organizations looking at new ways of working? So for the last uh, couple of weeks, for example, I started a research project talking to heads of future of work and heads of new ways of working at, at global companies, uh, had interviews with, with Siemens, with uh, Facebook, for example. So looking into what is it that they are doing and I, I share some of that with you here today. Uh, and then we'll look into more, so what is human-centric organization? What, what are new ways of working? And I guess for, for consultants uh, also specifically and very interesting is this uh, idea of how can you lead the transformation towards um, new ways of working. How does that sound? Is that good? Yeah, great. So let's start with uh, what's driving the need for the new ways of working. And I'd like to start with a little bit of a, a, a quiz here. And uh, I invite you to tell me which year is this org chart from? And you can just put it into the chat. So the, the numbers, what year do you think is this org chart from? I'll just give you a moment here. 2020, yeah, good. 2021, 81, early 2000s, 90, yeah, 80s, 80s, 89, present, 2000, 2002. Uh. So if you look at it, it could be fairly recent. I mean, maybe a little bit the design kind of gives a hint, yeah, 70s. So uh, the design might give a hint that it's a little bit older, but it is kind of hard to tell, isn't it? You know? What if I show you this? When are these things from? So that's kind of, uh, should be 40s, yeah, even a little bit before, uh, 20, yeah, 1920, 1930s, right. So if you look at that, it's quite easy. Right? It's quite easy to see that this is an old car. It's an old picture. It's an old way of uh, how we dress. Uh, it's an old way of, of how we communicate. And all these things have evolved quite a lot over the last 100 years. Right? But if you look at the org chart, you know, this is actually from uh, 1920s, Pacific Railways from the US. If you look at the org chart, which is kind of like the cornerstone of, of how we work and how we organize that hasn't changed much in the last 100 years. Right? So we're still kind of stuck in all the basic principles of how we work and how we organize. It has not evolved. And actually just, uh, just before I looked this up again, this is from a book called uh, Brave New Work. And this was apparently the first time, the first official org chart that is, that is known to us where boxes and lines were were used. Uh, so we can fairly say that you know, org charts is a tool that's 100 years old. Now, obviously, this is, or well, the question is whether that's still kind of appropriate for uh, what's going on today and what we need today, whether this is still functional for how we run our companies today. And I have a couple of arguments to say, well, maybe not. Right? And just going to go through these. So the, the first argument is that Obviously, our environment has become a lot more complex. Huh? And we, I mean, we refer to VUCA, I guess you, you all have heard that. Uh, so environment has become more volatile, uncertain, more complex, more ambiguous. And because of all of that, uh, we need new ways of approaching these kind of environments. We might need new ways to organize in order to address uh, 
uh, these challenges. And that's one of the discussions that I at least have a lot with, with companies around um, where can we still apply the old way and where do we need new ways and what would these new ways uh, entail. One sign that we need new ways might also be that companies are dying faster than they used to. Uh, again, this is maybe some statistics that you have seen. So uh, that the um, Fortune 500 companies, so 88% of the Fortune 500 companies from 1995, they actually no longer uh, exist. And in the last 15 years, so 52 have disappeared, which means they either have fallen off uh, the Fortune 500, they have gone bankrupt or there were some kind of mergers, acquisitions, but they have changed their form. Another thing is also that, so if in 1995 you were on the Fortune 500 list, you had the life expectancy of 75 years, so you would still be around. But these days that life expectancy has gone down to 15 years. So uh, maybe this, this is a hint that the way we run our companies, it's no longer fit for what's happening around us and that means that companies are going out of business um, a lot faster than they used to be. A second argument is uh, uh, the increasing bureaucracy. Um, you all might know the gentleman here, uh, Frederick Taylor, who was the inventor of uh, this way, org chart, the org chart 100 years ago, the, the inventor of industrial and scientific management. And we might say that so, uh, this type of management, it was invented at a particular time uh, for a very specific purpose. So you have always to remember then when Taylor invented scientific management, it was the first time that people came together in factories. Uh, it was the first time that uh, we had this type of organized work at a larger scale. Nobody really knew how this was supposed to work. People were not really educated when they came to, to factories and it made good sense at the time to say we need to separate management, we need to separate the thinking from the doing because again nobody has ever done this, people don't have the experience, they don't have the education, we need to tell them what they need to do. Now obviously today we need different things or companies long for different things, they want to have innovation, speed, they want to be responsive and all these things. Um, so again, is that old uh, scientific way of management is that still uh, adapted to what we need today. Now here, for example, I had a discussion this morning with, uh, uh, with a company, actually a Swiss company, where we're talking about when do you need what's on the left and when do you need what's on the right? And that maybe if uh, in, an, in a context where you want to have the things on the left, efficiency, scale, planning, you have stability in, in your business and that still exists. So many areas in, in companies are still very stable and you can plan for the longer term. So it might make sense to kind of stay in this more traditional way of organizing and, and managing. But then again, there are other areas in the business where innovation speeds, resilience is needed, where you might need a different approach so and we were we were talking about ambidextrity in this in this context now the original term of being ambidextrous in in the business was always you have exploit and you have explore uh, and here ambidextrous might mean you have this managing for efficiency in a, in the planning world using traditional ways of working and traditional ways of management and you have other areas which are more about exploration where you need uh, a different approach now, something that's quite interesting is so if we talk about bureaucracy, uh, there is a big cost to bureaucracy. And this is a study that was done in, in 2017 by Harvard Business Review together with, with Gary Hamill. And they came up with an estimated 3 trillion US dollars lost uh, in economic output due to bureaucracy and the policies and the procedures. Right? And this is the only the US. Now, this is a very big number, and I try to make it a little bit more specific and concrete for what this could mean for a, a single organization by looking at meetings. I mean, I think meetings are one of the key characteristics of how we run organizations today and, and how we operate. And this is a, a very new uh, cartoon that I saw it for the first time just a couple of days ago on, on LinkedIn. And there are, I think there are two interesting things here. So the first thing is this, obviously, um, should we have meetings or uh, this meeting could have been an email as they say there. Uh, second thing that you also see in the picture, and I think that's gonna be, again, for consultants, very interesting because that's gonna be the key challenge for organizations going forward is this hybrid way of working. So you see some people who are sitting in the meeting room who are present and then you have these 
people on the on the right side uh, who are working remotely, uh, who are on screen, and that's going to be. And if you talk to new ways of working leaders and future work leaders, that's one of their major concerns that they have currently. So, how are we going to manage and bring people to collaborate if we are in a, in a hybrid setting where we have some people in the office and some people joining from home? And just this morning, I had a conversation with somebody who said, "Well, uh, she has been uh, facilitating a meeting." Uh, and she was remote and everybody else was in the office sitting around together and obviously that creates lots of challenges and that's going to be something that uh, we really have to to deal with uh, going forward so not only maybe having less meetings but also trying to improve meetings in um, this hybrid setting now here's another study about uh, this was published by mit sloan uh, looking at the impact that meeting free days have on a couple of variables that you see here uh, on the left. So people were asked uh, after one day of no meetings, what did it do to their feeling of autonomy, communication, engagement, productivity, and so on. And as you can see, um, the sweet spot kind of seems to be in the, in the three, four days where uh, you have lots of benefits if you have meeting free days. Uh, so if you just look at productivity, for example, and so uh, if you have like three, what well, starts with two up to four meeting free days, people feel up to 70, 75% more productive. Uh, so if you think about all the lost productivity, again, that we have um, due to meetings, and how you could just improve it by getting rid of some meetings. Uh, another, there was an experiment, Salesforce, so the, the software company, they did an experiment, and they had a, a full week of no meetings for all of Salesforce worldwide. And I think, I think it's some, some 28,000 people. Uh, and they did that experiment and actually 80, 81% of the people said that they wanna have more of these meeting free weeks for the whole company. Just the same results like here, uh, they felt more productive, they were more engaged, they were happier, more satisfied, less stress just because there were no meetings. Now, if you just so going back to the three trillion, if you want to make, make that more specific for a company, uh, again, yesterday I spoke to a, to a company, they did an analysis and they came up with that 60 to 70 percent of their people spend time spent or their, no, their people spend 60 to 70 percent of their time in meetings. Now, the company I spoke to yesterday, they are around 20,000 people worldwide. I just did the math with 1,000 people. But if you look at it, so if you think you have a company with 1,000 people, and I took the median US salary, which is last year was uh, 77,000 US dollars. So this means that every year, a company of 1,000 where 1,000 people where 60 to 70% are spent in meetings pays around 50 million for meetings. Think about it. I mean, it's a huge cost, right? The company, as I said, that I was talking to yesterday, they have 20,000 people and it's a manufacturing company. So they have blue collar workers as well, which hopefully don't spend that much time in meetings. But again, if you look at it and you just think that 10,000 people of this company spend 60 to 70% of their time in meetings, that means that the company is paying 500 million per year for people to spend their time in meetings. And we all know that meetings are not the most productive way of spending our time, right? And if you then go back to uh, this, uh, set, this table here and you think that you could just have two meeting free days per week and you would get 70% increase in productivity, you could kind of recoup 30 or if it's 10,000 people, 300 million in lost productivity just by changing this very element of uh, how we work and thinking about how to improve meetings or uh, eliminate meetings. Now, obviously all this, like the bureaucracy and the meeting, it, meetings, it also has led to what we call the great resignation. So great resignation, obviously it's a, it's a little bit more of a phenomenon in, in the US and in the Western world, but it just means that now during COVID and after COVID now, people have uh, started to leave their jobs in record numbers. And, Two industries are impacted by that. Mostly one is healthcare. So you can say, yes, this is obviously due to COVID. And that's why you know, lots of stress put on these people in, in the healthcare industry. That's why they're leaving. But interestingly, it's also technology. 
Right? So you might think that if you, you, know, you think about technology companies, you think about Salesforce or Apple and Google and, and Amazon and all these, or Facebook, you might say, well, why would you need to leave these companies? We always think as, as the, uh, about these companies as startups with flat hierarchies and all these things, but apparently uh, it's also not going too well or the, the way these companies are run and managed is also having an impact on people. But it's not only COVID. I mean, long before COVID, you've probably also seen this. Uh, we had Gallup studies, which year after year shows that 85% of people are globally on average are disengaged at work. Uh, so think about it. You have 85% of people uh, that come to work and they are disengaged. And what I even find more interesting out of the 85%, the there is uh, 60 percentage points of people that are disengaged and there is 25 percentage points of people that are actively disengaged and actively disengaged mean that they actively sabotage work so these are the people who come to the office and they spread um, rumors and they create bad atmosphere and they they complain about colleagues and they keep on complaining about the company so think about it you have 25 percent of people uh, who actively sabotage your company uh, when they come to work uh, and again all this uh, one hypothesis is it's due to the way we run our companies it's due to the way we work and to due to the ways we um, we organize. Yes, right. Toxic culture. Yes. So you have 25% of people who actually who actively create a toxic uh, culture when coming to work. And on top of that, you have so here we're talking about employees. Obviously, this in, in includes um, managers. And uh, Gallup has done another study uh, that in the so during COVID, uh, the burnout rate, uh, diagnosed dep depression uh, has increased significantly among uh, managers. So it's not just employees, it's also managers. So again, the, the, the way we work and the way we lead and manage, it's bad for employees, but it's also bad uh, for managers. And again, so Gallup here says that this costs the world economy 8.3, 8.2 trillion uh, US dollars per year. Uh, so quite a lot of arguments of why the ways we organize work and lead uh, is not working. And so th this is kind of like all the, the negative elements, if you like, but there's also the the, the positive side, which is the potential benefits of, of changing. Uh, and, and here I looked at, at various studies. So this is a summary I did uh, looking at various studies where companies introduce new ways of working. And this could be agile, for example, agile transformation. It could be self-management. It could be design thinking, uh, just using design thinking. And these are kind of summary results of what such companies have achieved. So you see lots of increased speed of execution, uh, improve bottom line results, better customer satisfaction, increased productivity, and also more engaged uh, employees. And lots of these studies, obviously, that you find, they are from, from big consulting companies, uh, but there's also, for example, the IBM study, where IBM looked at what are the benefits of using design thinking as a new way of working at IBM internally. Uh, and they came up with a 300% return on investment uh, from using design thinking as their main way of working at IBM. Uh, and this is due to, again, you see cutting costs by accelerating projects. So you have the speed element, you have the reduced cost element, uh, you have streamlined organizational processes. So becoming more efficient, getting rid of a lot of the um, bureaucracy. So, so a couple of, uh, yeah, so much for the, the why should we maybe start thinking about new ways of working and what I called here the, the human-centric organization. So let's look at what is that human-centric organization or how could it be defined? And um, IBM, again, has actually well, started to define it. And this is the way they look at the uh, human-centric organization. So they say human-centered organization focuses on creating better human experiences. Uh, so like in the chat, somebody said empathy based. So yes, it is about empathy, trying to create better human experiences, uh, but not only for the customer, also for employees. Uh, so this is like the, the third bullet point here where they talk about care as much about the experience of a diverse empowered teams uh, as about uh, the customer. And then we have these elements of, of uh, resilience, continuous iteration and learning. So the, the innovation, um, that they also bringing in their de-risking innovation by um, 
doing a more human-centered work or embedding the human-centered principles into how this organization works. Now, this is a little bit maybe high level and, and fluffy, and we might need to, to decompose it uh, to make it a little bit more specific. And what I have found is that in, in conversations with, uh, with leaders, it makes sense to decompose this human-centered way of working or just new ways of working into three different um, parts. So we have the deorganization, uh, which is all about, so how do we organize uh, work? How do we operate as an organization? Um, then you have the teams, which is all about so really the core element of where the core unit, if you like, of where work gets done. It's a team, so how work is delivered, I call that here. And then you have uh, the leadership, uh, which is all around how work is, is managed and led. And, and what we see actually is that organizations, so when I talk to these future of work leaders, they kind of intervene on these uh, various levels. So helping teams to uh, get into new ways of working, and I'm going to share some of the principles that they apply, helping leaders to redefine their role and working on the more structural elements when it comes to uh, the, the organization, talking about the tools that they uh, they put in place, talking about processes, decision making, governance, all, all these kind of things. Now on the organizational level, uh, we often see charts like, like these. I just took one as an example here. This one is from, from Deloitte. So this idea that, so Deloitte talks about the adaptable organization right? and this idea of going from being profit-driven, being internally focused, uh, having a hierarchy in place, being siloed, one size fits all talent management and resistance to change, going to somewhere, something that they call the modern adaptable organization, which is more purpose or mission-driven, customer-focused, uh, flexible network of teams instead of uh, uh, hierarchy structure, uh, being more collaborative and, and having an agile governance instead of bureaucratic interactions, being more individualized when it comes to talent management and the human experience or the employee experience, you might say, and being more focused on, on all of this actually should contribute to uh, change and, and learning as a continuous feature of the organization versus that resistance to change. And if you, if you look at this, so what, what most future work leaders actually talk about is actually currently this, this collaboration. So that's a, a big topic. How can we foster collaboration in teams, but also across teams? So the idea of having a more horizontal kind of organization, which is focused on delivering outcomes. So this idea of value streams, for example, instead of having uh, hierarchies, uh, cross-functional teams, obviously, communities of practices, so that's a big topic. Uh, and also this idea, especially again now in the, in the COVID context, coming back to work, uh, having this idea of more individualized talent engagement, more individualized experiences for employees and how to enable those. So these are the, the three big topics that I currently see um, that, that these future of work leaders talk about most. So on the, on the team level, it's really all about the principles that teams apply um, when they get to work. And here, if you, if you look at the, the, a lot of the, the, the discussion, the, uh, the literature, if you like, but again, also, if you, talk to, uh, if you talk to future work leaders, it's always these five kind of, some variation of these five that, that I keep on hearing. Uh, so the first one is this more being purpose-driven. And with purpose, I don't necessarily mean a, we need to save the world uh, kind of purpose, but it could be something very mundane, a mission, but really having a mission that usually or very often is, is customer focused. Uh, so, and it could be something like a, um, a call center saying, we want to solve our customers' problems on the first call, for example. So that can be a mission. Uh, but you see these kind of things that uh, having these missions that align the team on clearly what is it that we should be doing what is it that we contribute to the organization and in that human sense what is it that we can do to improve the lives of our customers or if it's a more internal function um, the life of our employees as well 
then if you have that purpose and the mission, then this is going to allow you also to uh, focus more on, on progress and outcomes instead of focusing on uh, procedures and policies. Uh, so you can give a little bit more autonomy and self-management to your teams if the purpose, the mission is clear and people can really focus on uh, making progress and outcomes. Uh, so lots of experimentation here, bias towards action. So the whole idea of continuous innovation, continuous improvement, like we also saw in the uh, in the IBM definition. So really focusing on that and going away from strict procedures and processes that need to be followed, but really putting the progress, the outcome and the deliverables at the, at the center of what you do and not caring too much about micromanaging. How do you get to that objective and that mission? Then the idea that yeah, you need to collaborate within the team, have cross-functional teams, but also more and more collaboration outside of the company, so collaboration with a larger ecosystem. Uh, interestingly, also the work in the open, so full transparency. Uh, so I'm, I'm always very uh, surprised by how many companies and actually also very traditional companies where when I look at them from the outside, I wouldn't have thought that they go for it. But uh, this idea of default, um, default to open, uh, so uh, uh, all access by default. So we share all the information that we have uh, and uh, everybody can have access to it, obviously within the legal boundaries. And sometimes you have uh, privacy issues, you have regulatory issues that um, prohibit you from, from sharing everything, but, but still the idea default to open and that companies really have uh, or start installing the rule that uh, if you don't want to share it, you need to have good arguments for not being able to share it. Whereas in the old world, obviously it was always the other way around, right? If you wanted to share something, you needed uh, special uh, approvals from three levels of management before you could share something. Up to, again, this morning I had a conversation with a, a Swiss company. So they start talking around uh, on the board level, really. So what? how can you make board decisions and board, uh, board discussions and all the information that is in the board a lot more open and transparent throughout the entire organization and um, interestingly also uh, lots of companies they report that the now with COVID they introduced Microsoft Teams or Slack or some variation of that and this actually helps a lot to have more open uh, discussions and more um, uh, more information sharing and, and one company they actually they um, so they made it a, a rule or they, they frame it the way that every document whatever you create it doesn't belong to you, it belongs to the team and it belongs to the company. Uh, so that's why, why shouldn't you share it with the company as it belongs to the company anyhow. Right, and then so we have the, this fifth, uh, fifth element here. Um, no, the, the, yes, the fifth element on the left being people positive. So what I mean here is really all these, um, these uh, characteristics of uh, psychological safety, trusting people, being inclusive, giving people autonomy so that they can uh, they can manage um, their work as they see fit and this is obviously the kind of the basis for all this to work right? so if you don't have that people positive mindset then focusing on progress or collaboration working in the open all these things will be very difficult to put in place so we discussed on the organizational level what might need to change there we discussed the principles of uh, what is needed on a team level and obviously you also need a a new management um, approach and so if for example we talk about transparency and sharing of information if as a manager you uh, used to define your position through having privileged access to information you're obviously losing that and then the question might become okay what is my role uh, if you're no longer the one making decisions but you leave all the decisions to teams uh, what is my role as a as a leader and uh, the the thinking here is that you actually move from then being the expert who has access to privileged access to information, who can make decisions to being more of the, an orchestrator. And an orchestration actually then means that you should guide the team. So again, going back to the mission, um, it's leader role to identify what are the opportunities. Like the, um, the, the junior I was just talking about in his company. So he does not do the operations, but he focuses on identifying new opportunities and kind of guiding the teams towards uh, getting to these opportunities, seizing these opportunities, developing new products, new strategies, but that's kind of his thing. And then when it comes to the organizational level, uh, it's about really transforming the, the conditions. So really thinking about 
what's keeping our teams from doing their best work uh, and what needs to be changed, stopped, what do we need to, to introduce uh, to be able to create really uh, the conditions for human-centered uh, ways of working, uh, working to happen. Uh, so this then becomes more the, yeah, the role of, of leaders. And again, this is something that um, in this new way of working, future of work discussion, is one of the key elements that, um, that companies and, and managers actually struggle with uh, to redefine their role. And it's also usually more on the, on the mid-level management, uh, you could say, because the, the senior management, they tend to be more, or very often tend to be more strategic anyhow and not so operational. Uh, so for them, they kind of stay in, in where they are, but it's more for the middle management really where their job and how they define their job um, changes. Good, so then let me come to the, to the last bit here, uh, which might also be interesting for you in terms of what are the principles of uh, leading the transformation or leading that, that change? Um, and the question or the, the hypothesis is that, so new ways of working, they also require new ways of transformation. And here are kind of the, the, the principles, uh, the five principles that I propose. So outcomes over procedures, starting small over a big bang, inviting over enforcing, focusing on behavior over focusing on mindset and top down over uh, bottom up. So let me just go, uh, go through that in, in, in a little bit of detail. Now outcomes over procedures. So again, just like what we discussed about before, uh, focusing on the outcomes and not focusing too much on the ways to get there, micromanaging the processes and having all uh, the process is lined out. Right? And this graph here is from um, John Smart. Uh, he, he also used to be at Deloitte. He has written a book which is called Better Value, Sooner, Safer, Happier. Uh, so really focusing on these outcomes, we want to provide better quality, uh, which means that we need more often feedback from users, which could be employees, which could be customers, sooner. Uh, so you want to Bias towards action, I called it before. Uh, you want to get something out quite quickly. You focus on the flow of, of delivering work, safer. So in his context, it's a lot about quality. It's about compliance and happier. So again, this idea of everything that, uh, that we've spoken about is going to make teams more engaged and, uh, and happier. And as a result, and also uh, drive customer satisfaction. Starting small over big bang. So again, that's also something we see a lot in this future of of work context, small experiments on the team level, uh, instead of big bang change, we now all need to change our ways of working really more on a, you know, on a, on a team level. What does the team need? Uh, what works for the team? Uh, maybe they want to do agile. Maybe they prefer to stay with waterfall and it makes good sense for them. So giving them also the autonomy to, to do that here. But again, all the principles that I spoke about trying to implement these but using small incremental changes and incremental uh, experiments where you start small, you learn something, and then at some point comes the question, okay, what do we need to scale and how can we uh, actually scale it? Right? And this, this core idea, what I like most here is this ability to start finishing. So I mean, if you have a, a classic change management project, they tend to, uh, to last very long. Uh, and you don't see results for a lot of time or for a long time, you don't see results. And here the idea that you deliver something quickly, you have results and impact quickly, and then you move on to the, to the next smaller thing. Invite over enforce. So if you think about, I said my, my key topic was always innovation. And if you think about this as organizational innovation, so no product innovation, no business model innovation, but you innovate the way you work and the way you organize, like any type of innovation, there is an adoption curve. So you have some people who are early adopters uh, who want to do this uh, quite quickly and who are eager to learn it. And you're always going to have people who are more skeptic and uh, who, um, who need a little bit more time to be convinced or persuaded that this is a good idea. So you should start with those who want to. And that's, again, something I see a lot in, in organizations happening that you have this, this future of work department and they just offer the service, okay, if you're interested and you want to improve your ways of working, just call us and we help you do it instead of having it mandated really from the top down that, that everybody needs to do it. 
Behavior over mindset. So from psychology, we know that it's easier to act ourselves in new ways of thinking than to think ourselves in new ways of acting. And so uh, again, this idea that instead of working lots of on the mindset, doing lots of communication campaigns, for example, all these things really start focusing on the behavior and try to get people to act in new ways, which is then going to drive the, the thinking in new ways. So um, again, it's something that I hear a lot from these future work leaders. They want to do something tangible. Uh, so they have the objective of, we need to change the culture. But then if they introduce Microsoft Teams, for example, uh, they, try to, um, they try to link the behavior they want to see on the culture or the, the mindset they want to see on the culture side, like transparency, open sharing of information. They link that to the story of, we're introducing Microsoft Teams to actually help us achieve this objective of being more transparent and having a more uh, open communication. And then they show teams how they can use Microsoft Teams or Slack, whatever, uh, to foster that kind of thinking that they see. So to make it really tangible. So instead of focusing on the intangible stuff, uh, let's say uh, the mindset, you focus on really tangible behavior, which in most cases then it's about introducing tools, uh, technology uh, in the context of collaboration and future of work, remote work, hybrid work. Lots of companies are talking about office design. So how can we use the space uh, to kind of make people act in different ways? So they focus on space and they focus a lot on everything that's decision making. And so, as I said earlier, if the company says uh, individuals can make a decision where they want to contribute and work, uh, where they want to contribute their time and it's no longer the management, uh, how do you make that kind of decision? Uh, other companies have said, so this question of remote or hybrid, we leave it to the team to make the decision. So it's not the manager who makes the decision whether people need to come to the office, but it's for the best of the team and the team has to agree on it. So again, decision-making rules, are governance rules, uh, which are being changed here. And then the last one, this idea of top-down versus bottom-up. So this is also something that we learned a lot from, from agile transformations uh, that uh, without the commitment of the leadership team, it's really difficult to pull any of this off. Uh, so this idea that the leadership team is the team number one. So the leadership team needs to first be behind this, live these principles, because otherwise it's going to be really difficult to, to implement it into the organization. And here, so from, from what I, from I hear from uh, the, the, the colleagues and the, the people I talk to, COVID has done quite a lot. Uh, so lots of organizations, they had already future of work departments before COVID, but it was always kind of like a nice to have topic and it was not really top of the agenda. And with COVID, this has changed a lot and leadership teams spend more time thinking about these things. Uh, some organizations actually have the future of work department as a CEO or next to the CEO office reporting directly to the CEO. Others have it in operations, others have it in HR, but uh, those who are really serious about it, it's key on the, on the leadership agenda. Good. That's it from my side, just to, to wrap it up here. So uh, I think John Maynard Keynes said it well that uh, the difficulty lies not so much in having new ideas. And there are many new ideas around uh, how you can manage your company, but it's really more about letting go of the, uh, of the old ones that, uh, that we have. Good, and with that, yeah, just uh, thank you again. Uh, we still have quite some time for questions, I believe. And if you're interested in uh, more of this, I uh, have a weekly newsletter, which you can uh, sign up to at uh, snookers.com slash newsletter. And um, you can also, uh, I also publish it on LinkedIn. So you can also follow me on, on LinkedIn if you like uh, to get your weekly dose of inspiration about new ways of working.